Hey everyone, so welcome to our webinar. My name is Renato, I am Developer Advocate at Dashboard. We are very excited, we just announced a uh, new fundraising for the company. So we have a lot of uh, guests now into our tank to boost our product and, and increase the offering. We are bringing you guys for the serverless world. So I have here with me Tavi. Uh, Rehemagi, he's our CEO, founder, co-founder of uh, Dashboard, and he's going to be leading the talk today about serverless at scale, the future and present of modern cloud applications. So Tavi, welcome. Hey, uh, hey from me as well, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, I see a lot of, uh, lot of participants already. Um, to clear it up, yes, we did um, close the funding round, but actually the more significant news is that we also released a significant product update yesterday. Uh, so, uh, but my talk isn't going to be just focused on the product. Uh, most of it is actually going to be focusing on serverless at scale. Uh, what happens when you have a serverless application in the cloud and you end up having a lot of users and load on it? Uh, what could be the problems and uh, also the best practices um, to follow when you're building such applications? Um, so I will start my uh, presentation and uh, there will be questions in the end. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the Q&A uh, function of the um, Zoom and then we will be happy to answer them uh, after this presentation. Uh, so I hope you can still see, uh, all see my screen. Renato, can you confirm? Yes, I can okay. see your screen. Awesome. So a few words about Dashboard. Uh, we're a startup, uh, two and a half years old, and our mission is to help engineers uh, succeed with modern cloud environments. Uh, most of the team has been working in the cloud application space for uh, five to 10 years, uh, and we have extensive experience. And actually, Dashboard was founded because we had a lot of problems with uh, some of the functionality that exists currently. Uh, we provide a managed monitoring and analytics platform for uh, managed services in AWS. And today in the morning, I just checked, we actually have over 7,000 AWS accounts that are connected. And collectively, we monitor 600,000 Lambda functions and a lot of other resources like uh, DynamoDB tables, SQS queues, API gateways and such. Uh, so this has kind of, this talk is also a lot about what we've learned over the past two and a half years that we've uh, been working on Dashboard and a lot of it is actually from the customer calls as well. So um, yeah, uh, a few words about me. I've been a software developer for uh, 12 years. Do not look at the haircut here. Uh, I, <laughs> it's, uh, I promise it's the same person. I've been building serverless applications since the very beginning. So pretty much when AWS launched Lambda in 2014, uh, I started playing around with it and actually was fortunate enough to be one of the first ones, which also gave a good push to st uh, start uh, Dashboard. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder and you can reach me at tavi at dashboard.io. Um, so let's jump into the agenda. Uh, the first part is exploring the challenges of high scale serverless. So what I mean by that is looking at an architecture or a system and then identifying problematic areas that you might be having problems uh, rather sooner or later in the life cycle of your application. Uh, the next part will be around patterns and best practices. So uh, not only do we provide a monitoring service, we talk to our customers a lot and actually see uh, what how they solve problems and help them overcome them sometimes as well. So a couple of best practices that we've um, gone over and uh, helped implement over the years. And then uh, the last part will be actually talking about uh, if you have a system that's already in production or has a need for monitoring, then how do you go about thinking uh, monitoring and operating it on a daily basis and uh, what could be kind of what makes it so difficult for a lot of organizations because it has kind of increased in complexity over the uh, last couple of years. And Renato will also follow up with a quick demo. Uh, so it's not just about pushing product, it's actually like two, three minutes of demo and most of it will be around actually what we see 
in the space happening right now and and like trying to provide value for you guys uh, so let's jump in uh, let's explore some of the challenges and take like a really simple uh, architecture that you might uh, I'm sure many of you have built something like this and uh, it's fairly straightforward so let's imagine a an API endpoint that uses API gateway and is backed by a lambda function and that lambda function asks database credentials from a KMS service to then make an RDS uh, database request to either read or write some information and you know you start out it has really little load maybe 15 requests per second or even less and uh, everything works like magic and it's super easy to build um, so that's kind of what we see a lot in the beginning and then if you kind of start getting some load uh, then you start experiencing different kinds of issues but this is also a good exercise in uh, you know when you have a production uh, scaled architecture uh, kind of the way of identifying potential failure uh, areas and uh, and scenarios so if we look at this graph we actually see that pretty much every service here has some sort of a limit that when you reach some sort of a scale uh, it might affect you and it might uh, cause a point in the chain where your entire architecture or request fails or is at least the performance is degraded a lot um, so you know different services have different api limits and it, different throttling limits but also um, keep in mind that basically any kind of resource can fail for different reasons such as uh, configuration mistakes uh, code failures code errors and just kind of a lot of different failure scenarios if you have a distributed serverless architecture um, so the common issues like what we see a lot are timeouts uh, and those happen at scale so i'm not talking about uh, code exceptions right now or something that you might just cause uh, but when you're kind of at scale then uh, these are the things that you might be running into i'm not saying that you will but some of those are quite common um, so let's jump into a couple of kind of a re refresh or kind of a way of of thinking about lambda concurrency uh, it's a kind of uh, like a good Thing to get out of the way before we start exploring different uh, different scenarios and how to fix them as well um, so the concurrency is a function of the execution time and then the average requests per second and that determines the amount of containers you have uh, simultaneously in the use and that determines the concurrency as well and it's really important because we're going to show it later but but also um, kind of a good thing to do when you're starting to scale your application is to look at all the different limits as well in your architecture so uh, functions not only do they have timeout limits uh, and concurrency limits they also have first limits so even though you might have a really good uh, concurrency limit there's first limits as well which means that during the scale up phase um, you might uh, run into them even though the concurrency level for your account is way way higher so keep those kinds of things in mind as well especially if you, if you have a really spiky load or something like that um, other services as well, as well have uh, dependency limits so api gateway has um, limits uh, or requests per second per region uh, concurrency first limits and timeout limits and pretty much all aws apis that you might be using have different service limits so before you start using them at scale uh, make sure you know them so you can actually map it out um, so let's jump into the best practices and look the same architecture but what we can do better uh, so kind of you know we did look at what could happen but let's look at the real world um, kind of a scenario so let's imagine that we have uh, uh, 3000 concurrent requests and each of the execution time is 2.5 seconds for some reason maybe it's does something really slow but it's uh, it's something that could happen so that would actually mean that this small architecture has set, uh, 3000 new connections uh, to your rds database which uh, is a really big load actually for for a relational database and it might cause it to slow down 
and uh, also API gateway is, is quite expensive and then you would ha also have 7,500 active containers. So um, obviously like there are some problems around scaling here that might affect not the Lambda functions but other services in your infrastructure. Um, so some of the best practices that we've seen uh, and suggested for our uh, customers as well. So keep everything you can in the initialization phase. So connect your database only, only once, cache the um, KMS queries so that you only uh, actually each time that you execute your function, it only um, executes the, the main thing, the main logic that you have. Um, so keep orchestration out of code uh, and manage all the, all the connections you can outside of the handler code. Um, so that already has uh, a significant impact on the execution time uh, because we don't need to establish the database connection anymore and we don't have to wait for KMS. So even an optimization of that size can actually drastically uh, improve the active containers that you have and uh, a lot the load on your database that you would be giving it. So not, it, not would it have 3000 new connections every second, but it would have uh, 4,500 active total connections, which is a lot less. Uh, but let's go uh, even a bit more further. Uh, so another common thing is, do you need an API response when you're doing a, an API call? Um, so for that, you could actually, so if for some reason you don't, then it's really common that you don't, maybe you just need uh, the response saying that, okay, I got your information, the data is stored, but uh, not like any, any other response. So you don't need to wait for the database query actually. Uh, then what you can do is you can decouple and do an asynchronous uh, data processing model where the request is stored in SQS and then Lambda is processing it which means, and then you can set the concurrency limit, which, which uh, is like a bottleneck and limits the load on your database and other downstream services as well, uh, while still being um, doing exactly what you want it to do. Um, the other thing is orchestration. So use step functions and uh, don't wait in code uh, when you do like a long running task and then wait for another long running task. So don't do that. Um, use step functions and orchestration. Uh, it's a lot better that way and actually you can replace some of the functionality with managed services as well. So you don't always um, need to do everything yourself in the code. So keep that in mind as well. It's one of the, the best um, kind of boosts we've seen customers getting. Uh, also, if you do need an API response, like I said before, that you might not need it, uh, think about, uh, uh, you know, switching out some of the services, for example, to save the load on your database. So it could be an unrelational database that you're using, um, using pro proxy or cache elements. Uh, also, you can do something on the client side, like implementing a client retry and back off uh, to so, uh, kind of wait for the um, response outside of the synchronous call. And, or you can also do webhooks or, or polling, which obviously has a negative impact on the UX, but it's something to think about as well when you're uh, going into really high scale situations. Um, so yeah, don't, don't orchestrate in code is, uh, is basically using step functions and also using really correct services or like the best services that you can use for all the functionality. And uh, I think the whole purpose of serverless or the paradigm of serverless is actually keeping the code only focusing on your business logic while doing all the kind of um, non-differentiated value with, uh, with other managed services. So that's one thing to think about as well. Um, so let's jump into the operating and monitoring part of the talk. Uh, I hope the the best practices provided you some value. But so this is where our expertise comes more into hand as well. So the problems around serverless and why they are so hard to monitor. Uh, so 
in my opinion, and I've observed, there are two basic kind of properties that make it so hard. So the fact that modern cloud applications, and we may want to call them serverless, are managed. Uh, and that means that you don't have code access to a lot of your services. Um, you don't have code access to API gateway, so you can't attach an agent and send a failure alarm or, or anything. Um, and that makes kind of you stuck with having an abstract control panel only to control your application. Um, the other thing is tons of data output. So you have, you know, imagine even this, it has like 50 resources, but each of them actually produce logs, uh, metrics, tracing data, and you also have configuration data for all, all of those. Uh, the third problem that we see is that fails are really specific to the service that you're working with. So API Gateway has really specific failures uh, around configurations and how to proxy requests and you can do all kinds of mistakes uh, with it. Uh, you can have a timeout, but also then you have Lambda, which has configuration issues, timeouts, uh, concurrency problems uh, if you reach at scale. Uh, also databases can fail in different ways. Uh, queues can fill up. So all the things that you could have are really specific to that particular service at that point in time. And usually the scale of everything is quite high as well, or, uh, and that can be a problem. Um, the other key property is the distribution or the distributed nation of those kinds of architectures. Uh, so you're looking at a lot of surface area when you're running serverless, hundreds or thousands of functions and different parts of, of infrastructure. Uh, and that brings about an exponential growth actually in, in kind of all the failure scenarios that can happen. Uh, and then kind of the third part of distrib distributed nature is actually that, that it's always changing and really dynamic and developers can add or remove parts and can uh, change functionality as well. So it's in a constant kind of state of change. So that's kind of the reasons why we see a lot of our customers struggling with it. And kind of if you pro break that down even further, what are the monitoring challenges that you might be facing? Uh, so the large and complex surface area, you know, hundreds of thousands of, hundreds or thousands of resources, um, easy to, um, for the attacker or a, like a security perspective, easy to attack and overlook vulnerabilities as an engineer. Uh, permission management, um, all the verbose logging, logging that I was talking about, um, specific know-how, understanding the resource relationships and kind of non-trivial, hard to diagnose incidents. So a resource could be impacted by another resource uh, up or downstream in your infrastructure. So that's a quite complex environment. Um, so our kind of synthesis on all of the above <laughs> and kind of what we've observed and worked with customers uh, delivered us to a product or a platform that basically um, rests on three core pillars of what we think uh, is necessary to effectively operate a serverless architecture or serverless system uh, at scale. Uh, so the first category is observability, which means that uh, our kind of first goal is to make all the data that you have in your cloud environment uh, really democratized and available, which means that you can query, you can search, you can build all different types of dashboards. Uh, we have pre-built um, views as well, which should make all of your environment really easy to kind of navigate, to jump between different resources and uh, kind of be a pleasure to work with. Uh, another thing that we're adding down the line is centralization across different AWS accounts and different cloud providers as well. So, and kind of um, bringing all the different data types together. So metric data, uh, tracing data, log data, and configurations as well. Um, the second part and the second core pillar is uh, alert automation. So we aim to cover your entire infrastructure uh, with alert coverage or listen to any kind of negative event that might happen and give, give you a notice in real time. Uh, and for that, we are 
listening to log and metric data for events. Uh, an example would be a code error in your Lambda function, a code exception, but it could also be a timeout or, or whatever, uh, but also things like uh, API gateway failures, um, DynamoDB, throughput exceptions, those, those things as well. So kind of anything that has a negative fail, uh, we would catch automatically. Uh, we, we are able to notify you in real time and kind of also let you configure any kind of arbitrary rule that would help you direct that alert into the right place as well. So you have control on what you get uh, notified. And this insights engine is kind of what we're the most proud of and we see the biggest future. Uh, and I think this is something that's quite unique as well, at least to what we've seen in the market. Um, so our idea is that you have all of those resources producing all of that data. And on the other side, you have really specific kind of things that can happen and you have best practices, you have security issues, uh, you have the well-architected framework that gives you uh, recommendations on how exactly to build the best kinds of services and all those kinds of different types of knowledge that you have basically lying around in different places that you should be looking out for. So we've built a rule engine and an insights engine that does periodic checks against your infrastructure and compute data. And then it's able to catch non-binary issues. What I mean by that is if something isn't flat out failing, but it's uh, increasing uh, in delay or having a resource consumption issue or, or some li limit is being reached, uh, then we're able to detect that and we might prevent the failure for you, but we also kind of let you know when, when you know things are not like a flat out alert, but you should be paying attention. Uh, the other part is identifying security risks. Um, so that's like, you know, do you have encryption? Do you have any functions that you're not using that are inactive, but like hold an attack surface, those kinds of things. Um, resource over and under provisioning. So your ECS clusters can be under provisioned or could be in the risk of, of reaching uh, CPU limits, uh, same with lambdas or other services as well. And kind of the fourth part, which is very much under construction still, but it's, uh, it's coming as well, is being a well-architected lens. Uh, and the well-architected lens means that we basically take all the best practices of what AWS recommends you to do and what other kind of companies are doing that's helping them and then running periodic checks across your infrastructure to make sure that those things are covered. Okay, so that's the end of my part. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I think Renato can do a demo. Uh, you're muted. Oh, sorry, I thought I had them muted. So I'll do a very quick overview about our new application. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Um, so the so dashboard, as uh, Tavi was explaining, it's a monitoring platform, observability platform. It provides uh, several tools for you to follow up with metrics, logs, alerts, traces, etc. So one of the core pillars that we monitor, core services that we monitor is the AWS Lambda functions. It's the, the core of much of the serverless uh, services we, we have running in the cloud. So this is the view you get for all of your Lambdas. So you can see all of your Lambda functions here on the left. And when you open one function, you can see uh, different dimensions for metrics, for invocations, errors, uh, the duration. And we provide several metrics for you. Uh, the average, minimum, maximum, 99th percentile. So you have a very uh, a comprehensive overview about how your Lambda function is behaving. And it's very, it can be very uh, useful, for example, in order to optimize the resource allocation. So you can see that this function uh, at maximum uses only 64% of the memory allocated to it. So if it's not a time sensitive uh, workload, 
uh, you can reduce the memory allocation, save some money. It's going to make the Lambda uh, perform a little bit slower, but it can be uh, cost saving for you. And you can also browse the recent invocations for your Lambda function. And it's also very easy to filter uh, specific types of uh, invocations that you are looking for. So if you are debugging an error in your application, you can very easily click here in errors and it's going to show uh, all the recent evocations where dashboard automatically detected an issue in our application. So we have automated uh, algorithms that uh, detect in your logs lines that are likely to be connected to issues, uh, application exceptions, or even platform problems like timeouts, uh, memory exhaustion, etc. And then we also monitor several several other services like uh, SQS queues, DynamoDB tables, API gateway, ECS uh, clusters and containers. Uh, and we are adding more services to, to this list now. And so it's, uh, it's basically the same idea for AWS Lambda. You can monitor all of the metrics you need for those services. And we also produce insights for each of those uh, cloud components as well. So for an ECS cluster, for example, you can get an alert when your CPU usage or memory usage is getting very high. And so you can proactively reallocate resources to your cloud components and prevent them from, from fading. And it's very important that you can monitor all of those cloud resources in one single place because as Tavi has showed uh, very nicely, one component uh, fading or performing badly can put all your architecture down. To its knees. So it's very important that everything is uh, working uh, in a nice way, very, very well, and scaling uh, smoothly with each other. So uh, our goal with Dashboard is to allow you to make this type of monitoring, this connected monitoring between cloud, different cloud components in a very easy and straightforward way. Um, so we can provide, for example, uh, alerts about uh, queues. It's not being worked on. So it's a very uh, intermittent workload, so it might be an issue for you. Uh, task timeouts in AWS Lambda or an API, for example, if your API is timing out because your Lambda functions are getting too slow, because perhaps RDS is getting too much load and its, uh, its queries are taking too long to respond. So you can get uh, alerts about it. When your memory usage is too low as well, so it might indicate that you are over provisioning resources and spending money unnecessarily. Um, so that's the, those are the main features. There are many more here on the application that I'm not going to have time to, to cover right now, but uh, feel free to uh, subscribe to a free, uh, a free trial of the application. Just go to dashboard.io and you can try the service for free for 14 days and you're going to have all of the features in this free trial. So it's very easy for you to get a sense of how Dashboard can deliver value to you and your team. Um, I'm going to stop the screen sharing now and see if we've got any, any questions so far. So someone asked at the beginning of the presentation about the presentation slides. Uh, just to confirm, we're going to send to everyone by email later uh, the slide deck from Tavi and this recording as well. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't think we have other questions, but I just want to say also that uh, everything I spoke about the insights engine and kind of the observability part as well and the functionality and automatic alerts. Uh, this is all kind of uh, something that the community can also work at and kind of look at this application and kind of look at your infrastructure and then uh, let us know if, um, if there's anything that you should recommend as an insight rule that you would uh, see has a lot of value. Uh, we are putting all the insight rules that we currently have also to be available publicly and ways of solving them. So do think about it and I think we can make this insights part something that grows with the community and kind of be super powerful in the end and can basically tell you a lot of things about your infrastructure in real time. So, so somebody asked, uh, how does Dashboard make a difference with Epsagon? Uh, I think it's a really good question and Epsagon is a wonderful monitoring service. I do think that we have kind of different uh, approaches and visions. Uh, so I think, it, uh, and I haven't looked into Epsagon for a long time now, but uh, they are a tracing library and tra kind of automating all the tracing uh, tasks. 
and I think that's really powerful in the compute sector. Uh, our approach is more being a central data and observability platform and looking at all the data that you have in your cloud infrastructure and translating that into kind of a format that allows you to understand whatever you have in your infrastructure. Uh, I hope that answers it. So another question is, are we going to have support for elastic cache monitoring in the near future? Uh, not in the next quarter, but I think it would make a lot of sense. And uh, the way we're building dashboards at the moment is so that um, it's able to ingest data from anywhere and from any AWS service. And then we can quickly expand and add new and new services. So we can add new views for all those services, new insights, new alert automation as well. So a really good question as well. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Uh, uh, there's uh, one question came from Oliver. So Oliver is asking whether you, we can access third party log sources if they are running, uh, for example, services inside an EC2 instance? Uh, so this is an excellent question and this is also in the roadmap. Um, so the plans for the log ingestion part is, uh, is twofold. Uh, one, we're going to pretty soon release a, a, uh, a log ingestion pipeline so that you can do queries on your log data and you can visualize your log data. Uh, the other more, I think, interesting part that we're also already using internally for the Lambda function logs is a log event analyzer so that uh, you can attach filters to your log streams and then you can catch events like failures but also like business events and then you can craft them out without having to um, ingest all the heavy logs uh, into a warm storage. So those are our plans with logs. Uh, all right, I, so yeah, not currently, you can wipe. Uh, the question was, can we view CloudWatch logs with Dashboard? Um, so you can for Lambda functions, uh, currently not for other services, but uh, uh, it's in the pipeline. As I mentioned, we are going to release a log, uh, a, a log product pretty soon. So then you can pipe whatever you want into Dashboard and then you can navigate and trigger alarms for it. Uh, no, no, no new questions at the moment. Uh, all right, I think this, uh, this covers it for now. Uh, we are obviously available for you for further questions at any time. You can use the intercom in our website or in the app. Uh, also, uh, you can uh, contact me directly, davi at dashboard.io or renato at dashboard.io. And thank you. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. And I uh, really enjoyed giving this talk and I hope you enjoyed listening. Yeah, I enjoyed very much joining Davi and you guys. So thank you very much. Stay safe. And I hope to be able to talk to you guys uh, soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.